breakout. Gold's going to make a new all-time highs. Gold-backed ETFs in inflows of over five billion. Point eight trillion dollar gold market. Why are we the only guys to see on this Hey everyone, Shane Moran here, live from the vault. Actually, should I say live from the pool or live from the beach in Costa Rica? Uh, we've got an exciting episode, and the first thing I wanted to say to everyone is Happy New Year uh, to everyone, and thank you so much for the questions and the comments and everything. We're up to 6,000 subscribers. If you like the show, we've got exclusive information right here on Live from the Vault. And uh, with Andrew McGuire, and you just want to stay tuned, fasten your seatbelt. It's going to be another exciting first episode of 2021. Uh, and uh, again, hit that like button, comment, ask your questions, because we will get back to you. And also, there's a little bell notification. If you want to be notified as these uh, episodes go live, uh, then hit the bell. And so with that, uh, it's my pleasure and honor uh, to welcome for the first episode of Live from the Vault, all the way from the UK, Mr. Andrew McGuire. Welcome to 2021, Andy. Hey, Happy New Year, Shane, and Happy New Year to everyone. And uh, really, thank you so much uh, for all the comments. You know what? It's it's so important to to really pick up on what you guys want us to focus on. And um, you know, because really, I mean, there's a ton of questions, and and really, we can never cover everything out there, but. Really, what I like to do is to look at and see where where all the co questions are aggregated and kind of what we should be focusing on because time is so limited and two weeks pops by pretty quickly these days. So, anyway, with you know, with with time on the mind, let's start the episode by and the first episode of 2021 by looking at the first week of 2021 gold and silver trading. I think that has a few people concerned, but really we need to look at that. And, and then what we'll do, we'll pick up the threads from last year's episodes and look at what to expect as we move uh, through some very important stair steps through the next two quarters of 2021. Now, a lot of opening action was technical in nature. Now, I don't want to bore people with technicals, but we're kind of trying to keep it interesting, but we need to look closer as the fundamentals as well. So we kind of combine the two, but it's really important to, to, to drill down a little bit and see where we started, what that means, and kind of where we should be. And, and there's some huge pivot, pivotal points you need to listen because there's some really interesting things that are going to drive the gold price uh, that really aren't factored in. Now, so really just starting by as soon as New Year's trading began, the upside futures driven Monday gap open. And you only have to look at any chart to see we, we leapt up, leaving a gap behind. That left us a little cautious because this gap really gaps tend to get closed. And um, we had two upcoming Fed events as well, FOMC and non-farm payrolls. Now, both of those events have historically been heavy for gold. Hence, other than holding some strong core positions, we did not chase the futures price, uh, nor did we chase the physical price actually, but looked to average in fresh long positions into dips. Now I think the new year retracement to mid, I mean, we saw this retracement come all the way back to the mid December levels, which is actually where really the rally, the rally commenced from. And if you remember from December the 15th onwards, things got extremely thin. We saw a lot of spec interest coming in. So, but this has offered up a huge opportunity to pick up cheap bullion currently valued by all the first tier banks and liquidity providers that we speak to as some 500 bucks below fair value. So really that, that's, where, that's where we'll start. Now, but to provide context, last year gold rose some 24%. And we see a 20%, a plus 20% rise in bullion prices as a given for 2021 and at a minimum. So medium term, this points to gold plus 2,300 bucks. Now there's a good reason this level may be reached sooner than may be expected. And we'll look at that in a moment. But needless to say, this downside gap close was far more aggressive than could possibly have been anticipated in a strong physical market. Now, 
the official inter interventions experience last week was so blatantly counterintuitive to all the bullish crosses with the in intervention really flying in the face of very strong physical demand and Swiss finer, refiner delays, premiums being demanded for physical gold required for immediate delivery. So obviously this was a paper market event. Now this bullish demand condition accelerated last Friday into across the board reports of very strong spot and physical gold buying, sufficient to suggest that 1850 gold would be forced to be regained on Monday, which it has been now. Now, this likely will now become a strong support into dips in anticipation of the commencement of an upside gap close. Now, obviously we see, we see intraday moves, but we don't see that price being sustained below that level. Now, so really to sum up the 100%, this was a BIS, a Bank of International Settlements. We talked about them before. We talked about their footprints, their, where their gold trading desk is, uh, the operators behind them. And it was a BIS driven event, intervention in gold. And the two officially driven sell-offs were geared around, as we say, obligatory Fed events. And in last Wednesday, it was FOMC. And then we had non-farm payrolls on Friday. Silver was also weighed upon to assist officials. In, uh, officials do not have silver, but they weigh on silver in the paper market to assist in rinsing out all the fresh long stops in GC. And really, that went, as we say, all the way back to mid-December, which kind of got them to a level, a comfort level. But the official objective was undoubtedly targeting a rapidly rising gold price before physical support levels were about to be anchored above 1950. And if you remember, this, this sell-off came uh, just around 1950, just around 1950. Now, fresh stair-step supports at 1950 would have exposed a deeply underwater offside, unallocated, these unallocated BIS bets. And we've talked about these before. And that would have exposed them to a, a rinse of very large short stops and tripped in at the same time fresh sideline buying. And that would have come in at $2,000. So really the difference between round numbers, round numbers are say 1950, 2000, 2050, et cetera, as it is at 1850. So this would have happened, this 1950 as a stair stop support would have rinsed 2000 before, and importantly, before they had a chance to short cover, which is exactly what they've been doing. Now, this official in intervention was all about short covering, a short covering exercise ahead of a certain catch up gold and silver rally for that matter. Now the short covering was achieved by Friday's close, last Friday's close, non-farm payrolls. And while insiders privy to the upcoming selling, and let's face it, as we know, insiders act as agent for officials. What they did was capitalize by adding longs and cutting shorts. Now, this will, of course, not be evident until the deliberately, deliberately delayed COT report is published on Friday. And, and obviously, we've discussed the COT report in, in uh, other episodes. But official action aside, and as we've highlighted around every recent COT report, insiders have not, and I'll repeat, not been naked short gold futures or silver futures. They're merely seeking to capitalize on a known, this, they were seeking to capitalize in this instance on a known upcoming price rinse by covering off short hedges against their longs to further gain exposure to a rising spot gold price and silver, of course. Now, very short term volatility aside, both gold and silver are coiling for a strong rally. And this is a wholesale market view. Now, there are some very large speculative native short positions who were caught offside into the New Year rally, because as we say, in these thin markets from the 15th of, Mar of, De of December, we saw a lot of positions being uh, taken by speculators. Now, they had stops, and these stops were layered into an into uh, these the stops for the for the uh, insiders were layered into a known 
1966. This is a Fibonacci level, which is important to know. This 1966 level is really a level, it's an inflection pivot, and it was rising into that and pulled, if you look at a chart, it pulled just short of that. And the short stops above this level are so large, it would have taken as little as maybe eight ticks to force sufficient short capitulations to hard test the um, Rubicon line, which is, of course, the August highs. And it was this line that was aggressively defended. So important to understand really where we're coming from. And it was the BIS objective to protect these aggregated large size visible short stops from running their own unallocated over the counter related stops above that level. Now we see this action as very, very short term in nature and think the rinse of large targeted long stops into all of the major, very obvious moving averages has ultimately opened the way up as very few specs are on board. And, and always, it's always the case in the paper market. Specs are never on board, they're always wrong footed. And it was this particular rinse that did that. Now, footprints in the over-the-counter market versus the futures markets has, has evidenced the ejecting of very large BIS unallocated gold positions and swaps into a known volume of visible futures long stops layered at and below each of the full set of all of the moving averages, and they were targeted and rinsed. And we know that every major moving average, whether it's the 10, the 50, the, the, the 100, the 200, these are all major inflection points. On an, on an upside move, there will be stops below those levels. Obviously not if you're a physical buyer or a stacker. That's not the case. And in fact, it's the physical buyers and the stackers aren't the problem. It's the speculators who are known to have stops. And let's face it, when you margin your position, when you, i.e., borrow your money from a bullion bank who then holds the book on you and they look at your, your they'll know where your stops are and they know your pain levels. And it really, that's how you can aggregate. X number of, of, of uh, longs can be rinsed out and you can cover X number of short cells into that. It's as simple as that. Wow. So, Andy, here we are in the middle of uh, January. I'm, I'm getting the hang of this now. When those stops start to get triggered, I mean, what would that mean uh, for the price of gold as we're here in the middle of January? Or approaching the middle of January? Yeah, this is important. As we need to assess why the dips in gold and, and uh, in gold and silver will need to be bought, but particularly in gold, the only governing factor to halt the targeted full rinse of all of the uh, gold futures moving averages and why a paper market rinse cannot be sustained has been the active management to ensure the catch 22 arbitrage trade is not triggered again. Now, if you missed the, the stabilizing effect that this catch 22 trade has imposed upon the paper market, please listen to the last episode where we cover it in much, much more detail. In fact, in the last two episodes. Now, notably, as soon as GC, the gold futures, approached and moved into backwardation to spot gold, short covering immediately ensued. Now, as, we, as we've gone through many times, backwardation is the condition where COMEX futures prices become sufficiently discounted to the real cash market to, to be actionally arbitraged. Now, it's this governing factor that alone, this, that factor alone that will determine the most reliable higher stair step levels as we move through into, into the, as we progress through 2021. Now, with a strong physical market, which is directly related to the 10 times larger deliverable over-the-counter market, if gold futures are put on offer below these spot prices, it exposes undeliverable COMEX gold and silver, make, silver, making them attractive for delivery. Now, with this in mind, let's quickly recap what drives the Catch-22 trade and why it, it forces some discipline on the house. Now, last year, and notably after the March 20, 
Comex paper, uh, if you remember March 20, uh, so, and it was March the 23rd in 2000, Comex paper market blew up. Now we looked at in detail how the Comex had been placed in the crosshairs as a physical delivery market and how insiders and officials were caught out when they rigged paper prices lower than the spot gold price. Now in defense of increasingly offside options and futures paper bets, this became glaringly obvious when unprecedented large tonnage October paper gold warrants were demanded for physical delivery. This is a contract that never sees any deliveries in historically. Now, these physical delivery demands escalated, coming to a head in November. And as a result of the paper defense of these bets into a strong, tight spot related physical market, the house insiders drove futures prices into deep backwardation to spot and set themselves up for a very large delivery of very large delivery obligations. And as we highlighted at the time, almost live, this was physical bullion they did not have to back up unbacked paper warrants, which had been put on offer to manage increasingly offside long-standing options bets. That would be naked calls sold to, to cap the 1900 to 2000 range, which have been in place. All of these calls were sold by these banks. Gosh, I mean, you're talking about eight to 12 months ago. Now, the November catch-22 arbitrage trade that cost, this cost insiders over 12 million in cash settlement incentives in November, it's beginning to force some discipline on the house. So since then, COMEX backwardations have been avoided at all costs, no surprise. And last week, limiting the action to a rinse of the moving averages, not deeper. Now, given the underlying strength of the foreign exchange gold in the dollar and spot. Don't forget that gold is a, a foreign exchange gold cross, i.e. Uh, so that would be dollar gold, uh, it could be long dollar, uh, short gold or long, uh, long gold, short dollar. Now in this dollar gold spot market, the casino has been forced to dance to the 10 times larger spot market which is really the foreign exchange market. And although the COMEX and the over-the-counter markets are both paper-centric, unallocated markets, spot gold is nevertheless deliverable. And with Basel III rules in the headlights later this year, the over-the-counter dog will begin to much more aggressively wag the COMEX tail, which is something we haven't seen. Now, bearing in mind, uh, almost no physical has actually been exiting the COMEX. And it's our firm view as wholesalers that the bullion that has entered the COMEX following the EFP blow up in, on March 23rd has not served to do much other than to veneer over a widening, widening chasm of rehypothecated gold positions, underpinning an ever larger volume of 99% algo driven paper to paper positions. Now, any delivery request threatening to once again blow up the EFP conduit and at any such reoccurrence would be a final nail in the coffin for the COMEX as a viable bullion bank and asset managers hedging instruments. So, so, this, is, so this is basically where we've got to at the moment. Andy, this is absolutely fascinating. I know the last time, our, our last episode of uh, 2020, you covered this a little bit. You identified, uh, and I just heard you say it again, this catch-22 arbitrage trade. Can you maybe pick up on this catch-22 arbitrage trade and, uh, and maybe go into a little bit deeper? Yeah, this is great. It's important, Shane, absolutely, because this is, this, is, this is pivotal. And just to, really to sum it up, what we discussed in our last episode, looking ahead, aside from bullion uh, desk continuing to look for a price advantage in COMEX face delivery, delivery contracts. Bear in mind, that is a deliverable technical, technically deliverable contract that is really avoided, which is really not what the COMEX was ever designed to be, but it is technically deliverable. Now, if the house once more drives COMEX gold futures into backwardation to spot gold, this is something we've seen for years that's happened, but has not been attacked. It will once again trigger this cash 22 arbitrage trade. And as we previously mentioned, with nothing of size to deliver, 
the 10 times larger over-the-counter gold foreign exchange market will much more influence COMEX prices. Now, we can really continue to closely monitor this, but it can only ultimately lead to one thing, higher gold and silver prices. So there's two governing factors that we looked at that limited the casino's defensive actions and subsequently will force short covering as we progress through 2021 trading. The first thing is, if the casino backwardates gold, sharks will come in and fully fund the February contract, which is the next one coming due in this month, into first notice day on the 29th of this month, with a view to not take delivery, but simply to squeeze another profitable arbitrage trade. Now, the second thing is the bullion banks who are being rationed for supply at large premiums to spot, bear in mind, you have to wait at a refinery for delivery. And if you want that delivery for a client immediately, you have to negotiate a and pay a premium to get that ahead of the last ahead of, ahead of the stack, basically. So basically, um, these orders, if somebody, if somebody needs to fill a, a, a fill a physical order, um, basically, um, these they're going to be stood for delivery. And in some cases, regardless of the backwardated conditions. So COMEX is actually in a predicament. There are very large premiums attached to tonnage gold orders for immediate delivery. So, so yeah, okay, if you want a, 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 a kilo or two, it can be solved with a very small premium. You start wanting tonnage size, it has to be done uh, on a bilateral basis and large premiums are paid. Now, look, let's face it. If you're 500 bucks under the fair value of gold, does it really matter if you pay uh, 20, 30 bucks an ounce more? Does it really matter? Not at all. Because if you've got a medium term view and a longer term view, then you will darn well do it. And, and I think so it's a question now, especially as we talk, look at some of the other drivers in a minute. But really what we're saying is the best form of defense for the cartel has to be in to ensure a contango in futures is maintained, i.e. no backwardations, and to raise and keep the futures price above the 10 times larger spot market price. And at all costs, avoid the sort of deeply backwardated conditions that spurred a whole 108 tons of October longs that morphed into deliveries and the over 34 tons of November deliveries of a week, at least 10 tons were held by non insiders who had jumped in on the discounts to spot and hedge them. Either way, this will require higher gold prices. So there's a whole range of things that are in play here. And this catch 22 situation impacting the CME LBMA cartel is fully on the radar of the largest well capitalized trading desk. And by fully funding and hedging a hedged backwardated. COMEX long position into first notice day, which is why they're going to avoid it this month, and then standing for delivery, it's a very low risk trade, opening up the potential of very large cash offers to not take delivery. So this is, this is really unusual stuff. Now, from a wholesale market perspective, as we say, there's a consensus view that gold is priced some 500 bucks below what is generally regarded as fair value. And as a result, physical gold has been in massive accumulation by competing central banks and sovereign buyers, which is why sometimes if you need tonnage size, it has to be done bilaterally at a big premium. Now, trouble for the casino is that very large size bullion for immediate delivery comes at a very large premium to the paper settle price, except that is, if the COMEX is tapped for physical delivery. That is the equation. Now, one of the factors, this is interesting because one of the factors that weighed on gold and silver into the end of 2020 was that Scotia and Makota were forced to exit all their gold and silver positions into December expiry. There is no doubt they received official assistance in this. And there is no, look, <laughs> as there is no BIS physical gold ever leaves their site accounts. Scotia Makoto had gold and silver, bear in mind, not just silver. 
it strongly suggests that some large size offside naked short unallocated goal positions were squared up. Now, given the veracity of the New Year intervention, this is likely played out as part, this was really likely what played out as a part of the bilaterally, uh, the, well, really, as part of this counterintuitive targeting of the gold price. Really, which is what we're saying is namely targeting large size long stops to cover into, which we just explained why they do that. So most of the action, um, and most of the active trading desks uh, we deal with, which include two of the largest first tier banks, are also of the view that Scotia was underwater, a very large naked short silver position. Now, we have, to we have no direct evidence that JP Morgan or Standard Chartered bought these positions. But given the consistency of the EFP premiums, which are primarily held up by these two banks, it suggests some bilateral, bilateral deals were actually done. Now, the dips last week in, in silver futures evidenced a consistent 10 to 12 cents contango, with very strong spot market evidence at the same time. And this tells us a great deal and also suggests very large short covering was being evidenced into this game dip below $25 silver, just as it is now. Now, the deliberately orchestrated PSYOPs operation has tricked out a lot of specs, which is healthy for the physical market. This bullish gold and silver process is actually underway. Yes, we evidence a counterintuitive gap close following the January gap open, which took out all the rally from mid-December, but in both GC and SI, but as we also noticed, large spot index buying was also evident at these same levels. So, we're, so we see current momentum driven lows as unsustainable into a very bullish physical gold setup. Awesome, I mean, that's, that's amazing. What's happening is just absolutely fascinating. Andy, you touched on it or you, you mentioned this, but I'll tell you since our last episode, the number one most asked question, and I promised uh, that I would ask you is to give us an update on what is Basel III and what do these rules mean that are coming into effect this year in 2021? Yeah, great. I know. And, and that's exactly right, Shane. So many of the questions, it's just not being covered very well. Um, so yeah, in our last, ep last episode, we, we kind of, we looked at it in reasonable detail, but, but these, these, these rules coming into effect in March through January 2022 and how, what we're seeing is really looking at is how this will force, importantly, a revaluation of unallocated gold and finally treat physical gold as close to an equivalent cash asset. Now, that is a game changer and ultimately leads into a sanctioned and very necessary gold price revaluation. Now, this timing jives with the 2,500 gold revaluation target assessed by most of the first tier banks. Now, we think this jives with the LBMA's June 28th deadline to comply with Basel III net stable funding ratio rules. Now, the action following the, the, the Bank of International Settlements action over the last six trading days has evidenced a series of consecutive fixed painting exercises. Now, why? Given the, <laughs> the counterintuitive to physical, paper to physical action over the last six sessions, uh, bear in mind we're recording this episode on Wednesday, we are quite certain this relates to Basel III pre uh, preparations namely an attempt for the BIS to unload unallocated contracts related to large unalloc unallocated GLD holdings, that's gold ETF holdings, as ahead of the absolute mark to market deadline on June 28th. Now, the unwind of unallocated gold position in, is a, it's, it's a two-edged sword. And we must expect some short-term volatility, but dips will continue to be jumped on. Now I'm going to expand on this. So, because despite immense LBMA lobbying attempts, the refusal to allow the LBMA to exempt unallocated gold from the net stable funding ratio rules, which is, we'll just refer to as NSFR, 
forces a massive swathe of unallocated, unallocated gold to be marked to market in an untimely manner. Now, this is a huge opportunity to buy cheap physical gold in, in, into every into into every shallow dip it will be shallow dips as fresh higher stair steps are actually anchored along the way oh well andy you just mentioned uh silver again uh, can we maybe for our, uh the people that are really interested like myself in silver maybe touch on what's happening right now in the silver market yeah and and i think it's a good question and and um silver will be a massive beneficiary of the unwind of under liberal unallocated gold contracts. Now, paper silver positions, who also have to be closed, they'll have to be closed as well. This is extremely bullish for silver and why every major bullion bank is loading up on physical silver. And as a result, dips will be competitively jumped on by both good and bad actors alike. And for obvious reasons. Now, it's important to also keep in mind that SLV, the silver ETF, represents, much like the GLD does, represents unallocated silver credit, not a physically deliverable price. So we'll also evidence short covering of unallocated, highly leveraged positions. Now, the same banks, um, liquidity providers and trading houses value silver at a minimum of 35 bucks into the second quarter of 2021, if not before. Now, once silver closes the technical gap between 26,225, which is a very important level, and 35 bucks, which is a gap close into the 2012 sell-off level, it will take no prisoners into 50 bucks. We see 30 silver as sucking in a lot of sideline money. Now, we're 100% certain that insiders are filling their boots and will take delivery of any silver on offer. So, I mean, this is so deep below fair value. You don't have to be cute to understand that. I mean, this is, these, these are cheap prices. You're talking about a $10 discount in silver, which could be rapidly closed. You think Bitcoin is, is, uh, is, 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 is uh, active. When silver moves, it, it moves very quickly. Now, obviously, there's going to be a lot of stops triggered, but I think got to watch this very carefully because I think the next move through this, this very important level at 26 and a half is going to suck in enough to get to 30 and then 30 to 35 is going to be very, very quick. So, look, the upside profits in silver, what we're saying, are off the scale for the March contract. So, Yes, we may not see it uh, this month, but we will see it very soon. In fact, as we've said last time, looking at the option structure, the house needs needed to recover 25 silver very quickly. If you remember last time we did this, it was below that. Um, and they needed to do that to stem backwardations, putting silver cross futures in the crosshairs for even larger size delivery. Now that's never that's not happened. In fact, really. From now, the, the, the COMEX is now making the mark in silver, market in silver. That's why you'll see no, there'll always be a contango in silver. They cannot afford to, to create a discount in silver. Now, we're not alone in seeing dips in silver at 25 as an actionable physical buy. There should, this should bolster support at this level. Now, I'll actually update more information uh, on Basel III in our next episode. But the ongoing fight we highlighted between the LBMA and the Fed and the BIS looks to have hit the physical market rocks. And as we summed up last time, the attempt to exempt unallocated gold credits from the NSFR haircut should defeat the whole purpose of requiring gold to be treated as a first year asset. So this is required before governments can revalue gold. So to put this into context, Literally hundreds of tons of unallocated gold is traded and cleared by the five LPMCL cartel of trading banks every day. I mean, mind blowing, but true. Now that is hundreds of tons when actually physically delivered through the, uh, through the fixes, looking to three to five tons maximum. 
Now, the LBMA argument to exempt unallocated gold uh, traded and cleared by the MP LPMCL, uh, as they, they put it in their own words, in fact, I, I made a copy of it. Um, so, applying stable funding requirements to unallocated balances would jeopardize the clearing and settlement system for precious metals, end quote. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the whole point of this. This would end the ability to net out paper gold transactions amongst a daisy chain of member banks, none of which are currently required to allocate more than one ounce for every hundred ounce traded and settled. Now, the argument that gold market liquidity would be severely impacted is actually a positive, the price of bullion. So despite protests from the LBMA seeking to allow unallocated gold to avoid this 85% haircut, when we would <laughs> rather see, we would rather see uh, 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 is what we're going to see is a move by central banks, sovereigns and asset managers to secure physical gold, which ultimately carries close to the same zero risk weighting as cash. So obviously, this is a huge opportunity. So the LBMA continues to spin the yarn, the fractionally held uh, physical gold, even when it's funded by a, a gold liability, i.e. such as a short futures position swap or, or a gold swap or whatever it might be. They're saying this should be exempt from any uh, such funding haircut. However, Basel III rules are designed to eliminate interbank counterparty risk going forward. And as gold constitutes a 15 trillion a year market in excess of a 15 trillion a year market and because central bankers require a higher gold price to bolster balance sheets the nsfr will be implemented so the, the, the lbma have been denied on several lobbying attempts for them to 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 waive this rule so to exit unallocated gold positions would either mean buying the dollar to square up unallocated gold positions or forced delivery of a fractionally held over-the-counter contract. However, over-the-counter longs are largely hedged, hedged with short COMEX futures positions. So this will also um, majorly impact the COMEX as a price setter. So especially as the catch-22 arbitrage trade is now actionable, risking draining all of the registered gold from the COMEX should it be put on offer. Now to provide context, cast your mind back to the EFB blowout in March. It was a sudden tightness in physical market supply that triggered demands for unallocated gold to be physically delivered. And it was the inability to deliver this unallocated FX gold contracts on a T plus two basis that blew up the paper market expanding premiums to square paper to, to as high as a hundred bucks an ounce, if you remember. Now this blow up cost hundreds of millions of losses for first tier and second tier banks and literally forced the exit of several second tier banks that we know of. Now, Basel III rules will impact the entire global gold market and the demand for physical gold will be on a magnitude never experienced before. So imagine the scale of a potential blow up here, 100 bucks could be a hell of a lot more. And this would be, this is really the commencement of an orchestrated official gold market revaluation. And as we discussed in our last episode, the scaremongering of liquidity arguments that the LBMA put up is just a spoke screen. If unallocated gold continue to be utilized as the funding source for gold leases, which is one of the major issue, major trading uh, profit, profitable areas for the banks, accommodating such onerous financing conditions with a 80% haircut would lead to a massive increase in leasing costs, which given the fragility of the paper to gold condition after the AFP blow up and the COMEX having to import more physical bullion in attempt to restore confidence is simultaneously being targeted for this bullion at an unallocated price. This is unsustainable. So in other words, the LBMA have until June the 28th to close or fully allocate unallocated gold positions cleared between members every day. Yes, 
there will be an exodus of bullion banks from the gold market, but this will just be the bad actors. In fact, as we know, we have already seen several major players already exit the, the unallocated gold market. Scotia was the most recent, and that's for the, exactly this same reason. Now, the remaining players hanging on to the coattails of global central banks have also openly been accumulating physical gold and silver for their own books, and it will greatly profit. They're going to greatly profit from a gold price revaluation. Now, we've so really, you know, that, that, that's pretty much what we're seeing now. But there's, there's, there's one thing that, that, that I did, did, did um, ha, saw some questions on, which, um, which, which I thought maybe just quickly cover. Because there's been a lot, and this, this is just, we're just talking about the last uh, couple of days. Uh, we've seen a lot of hand wringing following the most recent COT report. And obviously traders know what that is. It, is, it really shows you where the positioning of the big banks versus the speculators are and the various categories of those banks. But, well, a lot of hand-wringing hand -wringing following this report because it looked very bearish for gold and silver. But I need to reiterate here, aside from the fact that only insiders acting as agents for officials would be naked short ahead of a known intervention, no first or second year bullion bank or any trading desk is naked short gold or silver following the EFB blow up. Um, however, what is blatantly clear is that this deliberately delayed report, and it is deliberately delayed in this, in this, in this picosecond wor world where reports are, are gathered and publishable every day, why should there be a three day delay in this report? It's ludicrous to even, no one questions it, but it is ludicrous that that three day delay is there. It is, it is because it's used as a tool. This is, it's that the predatory agent swap dealers who went long ahead of the New Year's rally knew the raid was coming and positioned a massive, almost 14,000 contracts, 43 tons net short into an extremely bullish setup of gold and silver. Now these were all covered and furthermore, these same insiders took the long side of every capitulated long stop, as well as taking the long side of every forced delta head short position. So I just think that would be um, something that, that that should keep in mind when you look at this one sided report. Well, Andy, I'm uh, so happy and grateful that we're so focused uh, here on physical and uh, not involved with these naked or these, uh, you know, mysterious uh, paper, or let's call it paper, gold, and silver. But uh, finally, Andy, I'm getting uh, questions uh, that have come in about the sudden or the, we're seeing a rebound in, in the U.S. dollar. Can you maybe comment uh, what is happening there? Um, based on the trillions of dollars of stimulus promised by the Biden administration, there are less expectations of Fed accommodation. Now, I don't think that's true, but this is what the market's reading at this point. And along with expectations that vaccines will end the economic lockdown, this has rallied the dollar off three-year lows. And as a result, we've evidenced an uptick in inflation expectations, and resulting in the yield on the benchmark 10-year yield rising above 1%, really for the first time, uh, since uh, March 2020, really. Um, so with gold and silver trading as important components of the foreign exchange crosses, dollar strength is weighing, weighing on spot gold and silver in the crosses against these currencies. And don't forget, they are currencies. They're not commodities, they're currencies. However, cheap FX price gold and silver is also evidencing strong physical demand. So short term, this bullish driver has not fully offset the heavy foreign exchange action. It will serve to underpin dips, though, as backwardations in GC have to be managed. So really what we're doing here is this is the first 2021 update. It's a shotgun blast of information. And by the time we record the next episode in two weeks, we should have a very good idea of the all important wholesale market interest where, where these interest levels are aggregating. All right, there you have it, everyone. I wanna thank everyone. Uh, once again, we're up to 6,000 subscribers. Uh, keep hitting that like button, share this information with everyone you know, and be sure to visit us 
at kinesis.money. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time back in the vault on Life from the Vault. Bye for now.